Texas Lutheran University. Our speaker today is Brian Bears, and Brian is an interesting character on a variety of levels. He is the fourth person I know from Omaha, Nebraska, and every one of them is just an off the chart, smart, successful investor. The other three, a guy named Wally White who's been here to speak, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, and now Brian Bears. So there must be something weird in the water up in Omaha. Additionally, Brian uh, now lives in Austin and runs a firm, came here after graduating from the University of Nebraska, has a degree in mathematics. I would encourage you to ask him how math plays into the world he lives in today. But at a very, very young age, he uh, set out on his own after working for another investment manager in Austin, and by age 27, was able to start his own firm probably with a whole lot of confidence and maybe a little bit of ignorance. Sometimes when you're young, having that combination is a wonderful blessing. Today, Brian manages a firm that is knocking on the north of uh, $3 billion. And one of the things I always notice about other fund managers and other investment managers is how often they are marketing and advertising. I never see Brian out advertising, which means that he has built a $3 billion firm strictly on reputation and performance, which is extremely unusual. So that tells me that he is probably a whole lot more the real deal as opposed to just a very shiny suit. Instead of me yammering on and on, uh, I think it'd be a whole lot more enjoyable if you guys got to hear from Brian. So why don't we help Brian Bears have a warm feel you welcome. When you hit three billion, you don't have to wear a suit anymore. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, creating a moat around investment process. This could be pretty dry for those of you who are required to be here. So uh, if and when you leave, don't worry about it. Um, if you have questions, though, feel free to just pepper me while I'm doing the presentation. There's nothing really super formal about this. It's kind of a derivative presentation on just kind of how I got to where I am and why we do what we do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to dive right in. There's probably 30 slides or so. And then afterwards, it's just going to be a, hopefully a long Q&A and you guys can fire, fire away. Um, I will say first, thanks to Dave. Uh, this is a pretty unique program that he set up. And I think it's probably worth uh, you know, taking just a minute to acknowledge the fact that like, there are very few schools this size uh, in a location like Seguin that have this sort of program and that are getting guys like Wally Weitz and Pat Dorsey to come down and speak. And so, you know, kudos to Dave and the TLU team for punching above their weight because this is a pretty, pretty awesome deal. And to get a guy like me to speak, it's not, it's pretty <laughs> tough. Um, okay, so who am I? Uh, as uh, Dave said, we're up actually above three billion now, which is great. We have three strategies that we run. Uh, for those in the back, strategies are just portfolios of stocks. So we have a microcap strategy that's been closed since 2006, a small cap strategy that's been closed since 2012. The only thing that we're selling right now, and we don't do much selling, as Dave said, is our mid-large cap strategy, and we're going to close that at $6 billion. And so um, we'll talk about the differentiators of my firm, but basically we're unusual because our approach is highly qualitative. Despite my math background, we do almost no computer screening or quantitative filtering. Uh, and we're very concentrated. So we have between 8 to 12 stocks in each portfolio that we run. Um, my story uh, starts in the great state of Nebraska. Uh, as Dave alluded to, I was a math major in the University of Nebraska. I studied math and actuarial science. Uh, it was the path of least resistance for me. I always knew I was going to be an entrepreneur and in business somehow, but um, I got bored with college and got out in four years, which was a rarity in my fraternity. Um, uh, I, I started working in Austin. Um, I followed a girl to Austin, actually, and uh, <laughs> married a different one. But um, I started my, uh, my firm in, uh, in 2000 after working at a small cap manager and kind of learning the business. And that's pretty informative if people have questions about that, kind of how to crack into the business. Is, uh, I have kind of a unique story around that. It's probably worth, worth t uh, telling to you guys at some point. Um, but Bears Capital is the focus of the presentation. I've been running the firm for almost 18 years. 
and uh, it's been a, a slog. Um, this was the world headquarters when I started. That's my condo in Westlake, which is a suburb of Austin. Um, all the money that's ever been put into my firm is $21,195.14. That is, came straight out of my checking account. I had saved up that money working uh, at my previous firm. And uh, the point of putting this here is not to sh sort of show the Horatio Alger story, you know, uh, rags to riches. It's really that there is no moat in investment management. That is to say, the financial barriers to entry are non-existent. I mean, you can have a laptop and uh, file a registration with the state of Texas without using a lawyer, which is what I did. And you can be very easily off and running uh, if you have the proper licensing uh, to manage other people's money. And it can be lucrative if you scale. Um, so just to sort of reiterate, barriers to entry or moats in uh, the investment management business are actually non-existent. Um, so you have, to, you have to think about it in non-financial terms and start looking at the qualitative aspects and the structural aspects of the firm and the strategy to sort of say, how would I build a firm that's actually differentiated and can keep competition at bay? So what are the barriers to entry if you wanted to run out and start an investment management firm and start stock picking for other people? Well, uh, most people say, what's your track record? How can I trust you? Well, you need three or five years to sort of put up some numbers and you know, show the world that you know, you're any good. Uh, there are these categorization issues, which uh, in the industry sort of like, well, what are you? Are you a value manager? Are you a growth manager? Are you a small cap manager? And so you, you sort of say, well, I've got to sort of commit to something, but I don't know if there's going to be a receptive audience for what I'm pitching. Um, youth and inexperience, I was 27, had a baby face, no beard, and uh, no gray hair. And, you know, at that age, you know, you're competing against every, you know, Goldman Sachs person and Harvard graduate, and it's really, really tough to convince people to give you money. Uh, I didn't have a team, and uh, the assets under management is the real issue. And so in our business, if you have $3 billion, it's a lot easier to get the next $3 billion. If you have $0, it's really hard to get to even $1 million. And so there's this sort of chicken and egg problem. You need the assets to get the assets. And um, uh, you know, hard work was you know, my recipe for overcoming that. Um, so we went from a single $40,000 account in uh, August of 2000 to almost $3 billion today. And we didn't do it by getting individual money or focusing on individuals as clients, which is what 90% of the investment management world is. And so when you see your regional you know, Raymond James office or whatever, you know, they're primarily catering to you know, rich people on the right side of town or whatever. Um, or uh, money managers can scale to $3 billion pretty easily if you have a, you know, a hot mutual fund that's sold through you know, other brokers or financial advisors. We opted not to go that route and instead grew with institutional clients. Okay, what does institutional client mean? It means like, for example, the Texas Lutheran University Endowment or the U University of Texas Endowment. Neither of those are clients of ours, but those are the types of clients that we were pitching in our early days. So these large institutional clients will slice up their portfolio and they'll give money to venture capital, they'll give it to real estate, they'll give it to you know, equity managers, public equity managers like us. And so we compete for a small slice of this multi-billion dollar pool of capital. And we found a receptive audience in that client base. And if people want a little bit more color around that afterwards in the q and I'm happy to, uh, happy to do that. Uh, but along the way, we were trying to figure out what's our little you know, secret sauce. What, what could differentiate us uh, you know, coming from this condo in Westlake and competing against all these people in Midtown Manhattan? Uh, how can we structure a process to where you know, not only we're different, but it's a, it will provide us with a sustainable edge in investing and produce good results? And so if you walk away from this presentation with sort of two points of, of uh, remembrance, you should remember that we are concentrated and qualitative. That is, 10 stock portfolios, 8 to 12 is the, you know, sort of the real you know, boundaries, but you know, typically there's 10 stocks in the portfolio. That's incredibly concentrated for a typical institutional money manager. If you put money with Fidelity, you know, there's probably 150 to 250 stocks in the portfolio. Uh, we, you know, we step up to the plate watch a lot of balls go by and swing hard when we see something we like. Uh, about 60 to 65% of the weight of the portfolio is in the top five names. So if we fall in love with a name, it may be you know, 20, 30% of the portfolio by weight. Low turnover, which means we don't buy and sell very often. So typically we're holding stocks for five to seven years. 
Um, and then we're qualitative. So we, as I alluded to, despite my math background, we don't do any computer screening or filtering. Uh, this is shoe leather research. We get on airplanes and in rental cars. We go visit factories. We go talk to management teams, go to trade shows, user conferences, et cetera, with the hope of finding and honing in on unique ideas. So notice what's not on here, trading ideas with friends, you know, sell side brokers, pitching us ideas, that sort of thing. So we do things the hard way. I've listened to a lot of podcasts lately. I don't know if anybody else is into sort of these personal improvement podcasts. There's Tim Ferriss and all these guys out there. I think it was a Tim Ferriss podcast where he was interviewing this, uh, the guy that is his personal trainer. And his personal trainer has this great line. And he says, uh, you know, hard choices, easy life. Easy choices, hard life. And so we sort of went, let's make the hard choices. Let's do things the hard way because it's more likely to produce the results that we want it's more likely that other people are not going to make those choices and try and surmount these hurdles and start competing with us and whittle away our advantage. And so by doing things the hard way, concentration is hard. Why is it hard? Because it's really embarrassing when it doesn't work. Okay? You buy a bunch of stocks, they go down, and the market's flat. And like we had in our small cap strategy in 2015, we were down 28%. The market was flat. And my phone is ringing off the hook. You guys are you know, lost your touch, you're terrible, blah, 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 blah. Then we have a 38% year the following year, and we're heroes, and we're getting all these kudos. And so there's this huge disparity in our performance, that of the index. But over time, that rocky path has led to extreme outperformance in all of our strategies. And it's because we're doing the things that other people won't. There are all these incentives to diversify. The primary incentive is to have more stocks in the portfolio so that you can have more asset-based fees. I mean, we're trying to make money. Bears Capital is a profit-making enterprise. And if we went from 10 stocks to 20 stocks, we could double the amount of assets we could take, and we could double my profitability. But we're not going to do that. Why? Because the more we look like the index, the more names we add to the portfolio, the more likely it will be that we'll match that, the performance of the index. And we're not trying to match it. We're trying to outperform. And so we're doing these accommodative things structurally that make us different and that get the attention of large allocators that end up giving us money. Um, so more diversity uh, can be good if you want to keep your job and just barely deviate from the benchmark and, and have consultants fall in love with you and all these large institutions not really pay attention to you. Uh, but if you want to put up the numbers and you want to you know, have a, a career in investment management where you look back and say, hey, that, you know, I wanted to be one of the best, concentration is the way to go, but it's really hard. Uh, qualitative is also hard. Who wants to get on airplanes and go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota and meet with Raven Industries or go to Greenville, Tennessee and meet with Forward Air and talk to management teams? And you know, the guys in Midtown Manhattan are trading ideas with their friends and they're not getting on airplanes and replicating the sort of work that we're doing. It's much easier to say, hey, there's 5,000 publicly traded stocks. I'm going to take a computer and I'm going to identify characteristics that Buffett likes. Low EVD, high ROE. I'm going to screen on that, and now I've got a manageable universe of 100 names, and then you know, we'll do some work around that. Much more difficult to start with A and work to Z in 5,000 companies. And that's what we've done over 18 years. And then, of course, it's really easy in our business, especially at $3 billion, to generate a ton of trading activity for, the, for Wall Street and then have them sell you ideas. And so we're a horrible customer for the mainline Wall Street firms because we don't like their research. We don't take their research. We rarely look at their research. And uh, that's bad news for them, but it keeps us intellectually honest. OK, so there's a little, a little tidbit about structure and building a moat around the firm. Uh, how do we build a moat around the investment process itself? Well, let's start by sort of flipping it and saying, how do we build something that everybody else has? How do we build something that's totally undifferentiated? Well, let's try with, uh, you know, start with something that's easy to execute. How about? You know, screening on high ROE, all right? Something that's available to everybody. Uh, identify Buffett-like characteristics. You know, it's probably a high return on capital business, probably got good margins, probably got a little moat around it. That's great. Everybody's doing that. And I can tell you right now that there's zero alpha, there's zero excess return available in an approach like that. How about just relying on industry standard tools? Bloomberg, FactSet, CompuStat, turn CNBC on. Everyone's doing that. We don't have any of those tools. We don't have any TVs in the office. Excessively diversified, hugging the benchmark. I talked about the increased uh, assets under management that give us more and more fees. You know, everyone's doing that too. And then how about being um, 
having, lacking so much confidence in yourself that you need others to confirm what you're doing all the time. That's super common, even with really smart people from Harvard that have worked at Goldman Sachs. They're constantly calling and saying, hey, I notice you're a big holder of XYZ. Can I talk to you about why you own it? And I know that the, what they're really looking for is confirmatory evidence. That tells me that they're not confident enough in their own work and their own, in, in their own frankly, uh, um, intellectual honesty uh, to truly you know, make the big decisions with confidence. So here's your typical no moat process and some pictures. You know, you got the you know, eight flat screens up there. There's probably a trading window open. There's some Bloomberg. And then you know, you've got a mechanistic process that you know, shows your potential clients. You've got filter one, filter two, filter three. And then here's your portfolio, which leads to you know, 100 stocks in the portfolio. And you've got CNBC and the fast money crowd you know, shouting at you. And, you know, tugging at your little emotional heartstrings every time you hear your ticker symbol talked about, and it incites you to action and all this excess, excess activity, activity that's, um, you know, that's deleterious to your returns. So another point here, too, is that your investors, if you are investing money for other people, in particular institutions, they want repeatability. They say, okay, you're a smart guy, Brian, and I like this idea that you're pitching me, but how do I know that you can keep coming back and give me idea after idea after idea and produce returns over time? That's what they care about is repeatability of your investment edge. And it's funny, you know, you have this movies, these movies like The Big Short and they have these one, this one big thematic idea. That one big thematic idea pays off huge for uh, you know, a Paulson or Kyle Bass or whatever. But relying on those macro calls, you have to ask yourself, well, are those people you know, equipped to make that next call? and then that next call, and then that next call. And I find that you know, guessing quarterly earnings, doing these macro calls, you know, sharing ideas with friends, and outsourcing it to the sell side, these are things that are not repeatable over time, in my opinion. And I've you know, seen some evidence that you know, the, the, the best coin flipper one day uh, you know, ends up tails the next. So how we built a differentiated process, you can really go one of two directions. You can go this quantitative process, which will give you repeatability, and that's why a lot of investors invest with quantitative managers. And it might be unique. Hey, I've got my own little recipe. I got low EVD, but uh, low price to book, low price to earnings. I've got all these factors, and they back test well. And uh, I just going to keep you know, running this process over and over again and uh, let the computer do the work. And that way, I don't have to hire a team full of people that want to be the next Warren Buffett. That's a great you know, byproduct of a quantitative process. The problem is, is you end up with misplaced confidence in the outcome. The very idea of it being quantitative, you start to think, wow, you know, the computer's not wrong. But um, unfortunately, I've seen quantitative processes go awry. My old firm was a quant firm, and I saw it spit out all these weird results where you're like, wow, we're buying Western Digital at 42, and you know, my teenage son could read the annual report and see that it's a totally different company in the future than it was in the past. We're investing on all these historical uh, ratios and data points. You know, we're driving by looking through the rear view mirror, and this is, this is not the way, in my opinion, to produce good investment results. Plus, they're subject to competitive arbitrage. What does that mean? It means I've come across my little recipe for success in, in, stock mar in the stock market, and uh, I'm letting the computer run it, and then one day, somebody that I don't know commits a significant amount of money to that exact same strategy, and its value nullifies through competitive arbitrage in the marketplace, and I don't know it's, until it's too late, and once it's too late, I don't know what's wrong. Um, we opted, obviously, for qualitative. Uh, it can be repeatable, harder to be repeatable, but it can be. Um, you can generate unique ideas. You can go do a bunch of work, and you can you know, find these, these little companies in you know, faraway places that people aren't going to visit, and you can do unique work on them. Um, it incorporates non-financial analysis. This is very important. You guys talk a lot about moats in this, uh, in this group, and, and you know, Moats at the company level are critically important for us because we believe that the moat allows a business to com, you know, continue to compound in excess of what microeconomic theory would dictate. Uh, the problem with the qualitative strategy is it's hard to communicate. It's even harder to execute. And it requires cumulative experience. So in the early days, we were you know, putting our reps in. We didn't see the entire market. We were sort of starting at A and working through our our best ideas the best we could with what we had, but it was like drinking through a fire hose every day. Um, and I don't think we really got good at it, frankly, until probably year eight or nine. Uh, but we have to do the hard work ourselves. We can't rely on other people to do it. So obviously, we've gone with the qualitative. 
and uh, we've committed to formalizing this process. So our fundamental premise, and it's often forgotten despite its simplicity, is that stock prices over time should mimic per share business value. So when you buy a stock, you're really buying a piece of the business, and that price of that stock will over time, absent distributions and dividends and multiple expansions and contractions, approximate the underlying compounding of, of intrinsic value per share. Exceptional share price uh, performance comes from exceptional compounding. Just remember that. And we believe that exceptional intrinsic value compounding can come from three sources. Moats, management, and under or unappreciated sources of growth. You guys know a lot about moats. Management, it's a harder exercise to evaluate management. I think it sort of comes from reps, doing a lot of pattern recognition, meeting tons and tons of, of, of companies over time and trying to understand who's a charlatan and who's legitimate. And then trying to use your analysis to figure out how a company can potentially grow that perhaps other market participants aren't uh, focusing on. But the important thing here is that these three factors are qualitative, which is why we're qualitative. We're qualitative because the determinants of value over time are qualitative. So our moat around our investment process is a team. Uh, we have 15 people in Austin. Uh, they uh, have the company credit card, and they're on airplanes and in rental cars, and they're meeting companies. And um, they're doing that 24-7, and we have ops people that let them do that. And then we focus. We focus on those three things exclusively, and, and then have the discipline to structure our strategies so that other people have a difficult time replicating it. And why do I sort of keep harping on that? Well, if you're Goldman Sachs or your Fidelity, you're not going to open a 10 stock microcap strategy. Why? Because you're going to raise a couple hundred million dollars and you're going to have to cap it because you can't jam billions of dollars into 10 microcap stocks. And so when you run the math on the fees that that generates, it's just frankly not enough for Wall Street to pay attention. And what, what's left in its wake is this vacuum of professional participation that we can exploit. And again, a final point, cumulative knowledge will widen our moat over time if we're doing the right things. So this is our uh, productivity over the last three years. So we've looked at 1,500 companies, ruled out 722 of them. As a team, we've done 567 site visits, about 60 presentations, and it's not important to go over our uh, in-depth in process here, but a presentation is sort of a formal pitch of an idea, uh, which has resulted in six portfolio editions. So a you know, hornet's nest of activity happening, but very little uh, is happening on the account statements of our clients. Six new positions in three years, that's not very many. So we want the funnel as wide as possible on the top, as narrow on, on the bottom. I think it's important to remind everybody too that a moat doesn't necessarily mean an edge. What do I mean by that? Well, a moat is you know, your, how hard it is to replicate what you're doing, but just because it's hard to replicate doesn't mean it's any good. Right? The edge is actually producing the variant perception which leads to the performance. So what is an investment edge? It's a repeatable sourcing of variant perception that leads to sustained outperformance. It's a mouthful. What's variant perception? It can be a different take than the market has in any of these three buckets. Different amount of information, analyzing the information you have differently, or behavioral difference. And I'll talk about each of these. Um, most people think, even in microcap stocks, that information is not widely disseminated in the market, and that's incorrect. Even in microcap stocks, it's very, very rare to have information about a company that no one else has. Um, and if you do, it's probably illegal, and you can't trade on it. Uh, it's more common in the smaller market caps. Every now and then, I remember we were researching a company in Fort Worth, and you know, we thought that they had like undervalued real estate in their headquarters or whatever, but we realized that even after all this analysis, it's like, Okay, it's a $10 stock. They got two extra dollars of real estate on the books. You know, this is not a repeatable way to outperformance for us. So we buy at 10 and cross our fingers and hope that they sell the real estate or that someone else notices. It's just not really our thing. Our thing is buying these long-term compounders. And so, um, you know, the informational, quote unquote, legal informational edges that we've come across in our, our careers um, have always, you know, have, have almost never been a true source of uh, investment performance for us. Um, and it's really hard to have a repetitive process that exploits this. Uh, this is the big bucket right here, analytical. So you have probably the same information that everybody else has, 
or hopefully more competitive qualitative information. And it's putting that together and trying to make a prediction about the future that's better or more accurate than everybody else's. And this is very difficult, but this is you know, the majority of our job and you know, why we're paid a lot of money to, you know, to, to apply our craft. And then um, finally, behavioral. This is it's pretty, um, a pretty intense focus of the finance literature a couple of years ago. Uh, this sort of behavioral finance stuff where, you know, well, there's overreactions in the market and, you know, loss avoidance and all these decision-making heuristics that uh, cause people to do irrational things. Uh, I've seen people brag about this in sales literature. I've actually, in my 20 years, never come across an investment manager that has repeatedly used this stuff in any successful way, despite the fact that I believe in all of it. Um, so maybe there's somebody out there, and you know, maybe somebody knows somebody, but I, I haven't come across it. But it is definitely an occasional source of edge for people. Uh, we don't go around bragging about this or looking for it explicitly. If we happen, to p happen upon it and we can take advantage of it, great. Um, so here are our two pillars of a successful investment process. Uh, just building something that's hard to replicate and then c creating these sources of variant perception that lead to outperformance. So it's really about that moat and edge. So that's it. That's 33 slides in less than 30 minutes. Um, and I'll talk about what any, whatever anyone wants to talk about. Congratulations on your extra credit. <laughs> Yeah, good question. Okay, so most managers use price as an input to their process. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look for cheap stocks, and then let's convince ourselves of the quality of those names. Let's start with low PE or low EVD, bada, um, and you know, rank order our securities or whatever, whatever they do. We think that, especially with a concentrated portfolio, that's a huge mistake, and it's taken me a long time to, to sort of harden this conclusion, and it's not obvious. Um, Price is the last thing we look at because we don't want to make a mistake in the business quality or the management quality because that is going to be the determinant of your, of your success. If you think back to Coca-Cola trading at 45 times earnings or whatever in the 1960s, had you paid that 45 times and just held on to it, your return would gravitate towards the ROE of the business the longer you held it. So over four decades, you'd probably still be compounding in the high teens or low 20s. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're going to make a mistake. I want to make a mistake on the price. I don't want to make a mistake on the quality. And so that's why we, we do pricing last. Now, we do appraise every single company that we have. We've you know, been doing appraisals for a long time, and I'm not here to, to brag about the precision of those appraisals. We don't have sharper pencils than everybody else. What we're looking for is an intrinsic value estimate that gives us a feel as to whether something's expensive, cheap, or, or appropriately priced. That's a great question. Uh, we can do everything from nothing to get very alarmed and sell. And so um, each business has a different reliance on those kind of sliders. You know, some, some business we buy, the moat is so big, it can sort of you know, overwhelm a mediocre management. Uh, in some cases, we've bought businesses where the management was so good that that was the big slider to the right. And if, some, if there were a change in management at that point, it would probably cause us to sell. So I'd say that, you know, that moat management growth, there's kind of a slider, you know, sort of a zero to 10 score type of thing on each of those. And we want them all to be 10s, but the reality is, is no investment idea has, you know, perfect scores in each of those categories. And the more reliant we are on management, the more that's a concern for us. But there are some businesses that the moat is so great or the culture is so strong that, you know, it's sort of plug and play at the top, you know, based on, you know, people coming and going, the culture just continues to serve up, you know, fantastic people. Yeah, yeah. So if they're all on, on sort of sliders, is there one that, like, can you rank them almost? Because, like, if, if, you know, if they were, for instance, if you had, like, really excellent management and the other two were kind of in the middle there, mm -hmm. would you still get it? Or if growth was fantastic, but the management and the, the it's a, is It's a super heady question because something that's debated internally at our firm a lot. I will say that we don't rank order them per se, but it's hard for a great manager to overcome a bad moat. 
right? It, ha it happens all the time, but it's just harder. It's usually better to bet on a really big moat, you know, a great network effects business with a, you know, an okay manager than it is to invest in a great manager with a commodity business. So that's usually the right bet. Not always, but usually. Then again, had you bet on Warren Buffett when you had a commodity insurance company, you would have done pretty well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you first started, what would you say was your, the hardest part about uh, breaking into the business? And uh, did you have trouble getting people to trust you? Or? Yeah, yes, it's super hard. I mean, it's just super hard. Um, I was a little, I had probably had a screw loose. Like, I was just full of confidence when I was 27 and, like, um, you know, at the expense of everything else in my life. My, my wife likes to say when she met me, I had a block of Velveeta cheese and a six pack of Coors Light in my fridge. And that was it. I mean, it was like, there was, I ate every meal, like close to the office, lived up there. I got my car broken into three consecutive Friday nights because uh, I had this just seedy office in South Congress in Austin and it was above a bar and like parked my Jeep down there and like three consecutive Friday nights, I got the stereo stolen. Like the like window broke and the stereo still on. Because I was at work at two in the morning, I was just, again, I was a little, I had kind of a screw loose. And I think as part upbringing, my dad was a, uh, a, an eye surgeon, but he was, he was a good surgeon, but he was a really good businessman and brought my brothers and I to the, like some of his business meetings early on. And we kind of, that's where I kind of got my love for business, you know, and started reading the stock pages. And, you know, I'm from Omaha. I got obsessed with Warren Buffett at a young age. And, and, um, and so I just had a real passion for this, and I'm like the rare person you'll meet that kind of knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was like 14 or 15 years old. Um, and so uh, breaking into the business is really hard because 99% of the jobs in this business are sales jobs. And you sort of look down your nose at that because you're a finance major, business student, whatever, and you're like, I don't want to be in sales. And then you realize that's mostly my job too. It's everyone's job, selling yourself selling yourself to clients, selling yourself to, you know, to your coworkers, to your boss, to everybody. So um, I think I've kind of come full circle to appreciate that everything is sales. That being said, you don't want to be the person that's just smiling and dialing for money unless that's your strong suit and you really like it. Um, so actually, when I started in the business, I thought, okay, I want to raise $130 million in microcap money. And um, I don't want to smile and dial and, and look for that money. I just want to like pick the stocks. Like that's, that's the fun part for me. And what I realized is like everyone that would give you any significant sum of money wants to talk to you. And so you're going to have to get good at this or you're not going to go anywhere. And what I've come to increasingly realize is that the difference between the people like me with three billion under management and the person that's, you know, got three million under management is their uh, inability and, um, and uh, to sell and their dislike of the sales process. I mean, at some point you have to get out there and build a team around yourself and convince other people and use your powers of persuasion to, to bring money in the door. And that is a huge differentiator if you can do it well. And I was terrible at it. I remember our first big institutional like, investor invited me to like, give a presentation at the board. And uh, excuse my French, but I just shit the bed. I just, just I mean, I could not put two words together. I was just terrible at it. My knees were knocking. I was scared. I was like all in the room with all these Harvard guys and these Goldman guys. And, and I was so embarrassed. I went back to the hotel in New York and I was like, looked at myself in the mirror. I was like, I have to get good at this. Like, I have to get good at this. If I want to go anywhere in this business, I have to get good at this. And that, that's the truth. You have to get good at that. So if, if you're sitting here going, I just want to pick stocks for a living, there's like, maybe five jobs in the world where somebody will just let you pick stocks and not talk to anybody. You know, it's like, you have to get good at that. And um, the higher the stakes, the more important that is. And so when you see Bill Ackman on CNBC, or you see these guys, they're unbelievable communicators, and they're so persuasive. I went to the Texas Teachers Retirement System event. They put on a Texas hedge fund conference. And a couple years ago, Bill Ackman was a speaker. And whatever you think of Bill Ackman, the guy was so smooth. So smooth. I mean, everyone was eating out of the palm of his hand. He just had the greatest stories. He was able to communicate effectively. His process, the stock ideas, you're just like, man, this guy is so good, you know? And he has gray hair, which I like. But, um, but that's what you got, you, got to get, you, you got to get good at that. And so that's critical to launching the firm. I mean, you, you know, if, if you truly are the next Warren Buffett and you compound at 30% a year, like the world will beat a path to your door. Right? There are those people that are just savant-like intelligence and can do that. But if you're a high teens compounder like me, 
um, you, you still need this other part of the sort of talent stack to succeed. Um, and then, you know, the final piece is back to your original question. It's like you need entrepreneurial drive to make it happen too. A lot of people I see make the mistake of saying, you know, I'm not that confident myself, so I'm going to get my buddy and we're going to go 50-50 and then we'll sort of share the insecurity among ourselves and that never goes anywhere. For me, it was like live or die by my own sword, like plant a stake in the ground and move forward and just assume it's going to work. Because if you come across as insecure, like no one's going to give you any money. Right? You just got to say, I'm going from here to there and I'm getting there regardless of you know you coming along or not and, and that will recruit people to your cause. So. Well, we charge more in microcap than mid-large, but we have a larger AUM base in mid-large. Um, the game is a bit more, I want to say, professional in mid-large, in that if we're analyzing a company in the mid-large space, we're typically talking to an investor relations person. You know, in our microcap strategy, we'll get a call from the CEO on their way home from work on their cell phone or whatever. Um, and so it's just a different level of sort of uh, interaction. Um, the mid-large space is also full of more moats, I would say. You know, it's like there's a couple thousand microcap companies and the disparity between you know, exceptional and poor is pretty wide. Whereas, you know, small cap and then mid-large, you get to mid-large, you've probably gotten there because you have some interesting competitive differentiation. And so um, the game is a, a bit harder in mid-large, which is one of, the reason, one of the reasons why we charge less in fees. Oh, qualitative, yeah. So, like, how do you train yourself to think that? Because we develop habits of, like, thinking and yeah. thinking of ways and that goes on, right? Yeah. Um, what's, there's a quote, I think, attributed to Charlie Munger, where he says, you know, a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And I think, you know, equipped with a math and actuarial science background, it's very seductive to want to rank order your stocks on price to intrinsic value and, you know, sell the top by the bottom, that sort of thing. Um, I think, I sort of operated from first principles and just said, how do I compound optimally? And all of the you know, background I just gave about how intrinsic value per share matches you know, uh, share price or drives share price over time, just deconstructing those principles, I just kind of came to the conclusion there was almost nothing quantitative about it. The result is quantitative, obviously, and so you need to understand how value is created within a business and you know, common size financial statements and how that drives intrinsic value over time. But the primary points of analysis were all qualitative. And so I just came to that rationally and just sort of accepted that conclusion. And so, you know, over time, just sort of had to ditch a lot of that, that toolkit that I had built up over the years. If somebody gave me, you know, an integral in calculus right now, I would have to open up a textbook to figure out how to do it because I, you know, I've forgotten it all. So when you start with your list, you showed me like about 1,500 companies in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we try and fish in the ponds where there's, you know, we think there's a lot of fish. And so uh, airlines, banks, you know, s steel companies, commodity companies, basic chemicals, these businesses tend to be price takers, not price makers. There's not a lot of points of competitive differentiation in that space. So we, we tend not to spend a lot of time in those areas. Information services, software, precision instruments, there's just a ton of differentiation, razor, razor blade sort of dynamics. Um, businesses where uh, they're more price makers and therefore returns on capital are more likely to be high. So we, we just sort of spend more time in those buckets. Uh, but the cool thing about our firm is if, if you have a, you know, if you're intellectually curious about a certain area, we just let you go check it out. And so, um, you know, I don't say, hey, go look at company ABC. Uh, if, you know, if you've got an interest in whatever it is, you know, 3D printing or whatever, just, you know, go rip the space apart and come up with something. And if if it doesn't work, that's great. I mean, that's part of the process. And so we have, for each strategy, we have a research head that is sort of coordinating the uh, analyst activities in those areas. And so um, you can't just be sitting at your desk twiddling your thumbs. I mean, it's a small firm. Everybody's work is pretty magnified and upstreamed on Friday uh, to the research heads, which is distilled further and upstream to me. And so I see the activity on a look-through basis of what everybody's doing. And so you've got to have a pretty, uh, pretty heavy research clip you know, going in your workflow. 
uh, but you can pretty much look at what you want. Now, every now and then, we're going to say, hey, there's a particular company that we're following. Like, why don't you update the model on it or whatever? But, um, but for the most part, if you know, if you like, uh, you know, Align Technologies or Intuitive Surgical or any of these, you know, just like go knock yourself out, man. Like, you know, check it out. So, yeah. About how much are your travel expenses on a monthly basis? That's a good question. <laughs> our uh, after after employees and rent, it's probably our biggest budget item. So, I'd say on our. Our research analyst budget, ex employee costs, just like on the travel and the hotels and conferences and stuff like that, is probably a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So, uh, what is the, the reason for the what, what does it look like when somebody goes? Like, if, if, you know, if I were an employee and I was going to go and, you know, I was going to look and evaluate a company, how do you go about that? Like, what are, is there like a process or do you just go and say hi? Yeah. We don't, want to, we don't want to waste people's time. Um, and so we have a reputation that we have earned, that we do good work on companies, and that we don't waste our time on things like, you know, we're not going to waste a CEO's time on talking about tax rates or something like that. You know, it's like we want to understand competitive strategy, what they're working on, why they're working on it. We'll have a list of questions that will, you know, that couldn't have been answered by reading the public documents and the proxy and the 10K and all that sort of stuff. So we're not wasting anybody's time. And to the extent that there's something to see, we want to see it, right? So if there's a secret sauce in manufacturing or a cultural competitive advantage that people are claiming, we want to see that in action. And so, so each company visit looks a little bit different. It depends on what stage of the research process it is, and it depends on how complex. And so um, we own National Instruments, which is a company that's based actually in Austin um, that's a very technical company. We were following it for eight years before we made the purchase. And um, you know, went to NI Week and talked to customers and talked to industry consultants and all these sorts of things, in an attempt to just better understand the company. And then so that's one example. And on the other end, you know, we've had companies that we've familiarized ourselves with for a month, and it was in the portfolio. And so it just depends on sort of how, how complex, how much there is to see. You know, if it's an insurance company or something like that, you know, there's not much to see. It's people, computers, and cubicles. And so, you know, maybe a two-hour meeting with the executive team is enough to kind of get us comfortable with what's happening there. Um, if it's a, you know, a specialized manufacturing process where you got to sign NDAs to like look at it and stuff like that, you know, it's absolutely critical that you go you know, walk the factory floor with them. We'll sit in user conferences. We'll train on software. We'll go to industry trade shows and you know, talk to you know, vendors and whoever we need to to just sort of get the uh, you know, complete picture of a business. And again, this isn't about predicting next quarter's earnings or whatever. It's about understanding the competitive strategy of the business and whether that strategy can lead to sustainable compounding in excess of what sort of perfect competitive theory would, would dictate. Yeah. What did you think that process would take one? How often do you revisit that? Um, yeah, all these answers are unfortunately it depends, right? Um, you know, if it's something new, if it's something complex and high touch, we'll meet a lot. Um, you know, there's we own one company where the CEO is on the Forbes 400, and he's very difficult to get a meeting with. And every time we can get a meeting with him, we'll meet with him. And so, you know, if that's twice in a year or five times in a year, we'll we'll do whatever we can. So, um, I think early in my career. I got up. I got into my head about like everyone else knows more about all of the names that we own than I do, and so it was just like this intense focus on learning every possible thing about every business. But the pendulum sort of swung too far one time when one of our analysts got invited to the CFO of a company's house for Thanksgiving, and I was just like, <laughs> okay, we're you know, yeah, that's more information, you know. And so and the, the pendulum sort of swung back, and then it sort of settled into this like. What's critical to the investment thesis? Let's identify those key points and let's learn as much as we possibly can about those points and then ignore the shoe size of the CEO and all that other stuff. So you monitor it on a regular basis, haven't you? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Any new filing, we're, we're cataloging, we're talking to, you know, talking to uh, you know, other people in the office about you know, how critical is this stuff, should we update the model, that sort of thing. Obviously, earnings calls, every, every management meeting that we do. Um, you know, if something happens competitively, you know, we'll, 
interestingly, you know, one big behavioral finance piece of all this is that a lot of people anchor on purchase price. So we're, we, we work really hard to be dispassionate about that. And you know, let's say we buy something at 50, and uh, the competitive thesis start, starts to de deteriorate. You know, we'll sell regardless of whether the stock price is 35 or 85. You know, we're not trying to anchor on that stock price to sort of, you know, that purchase price to try and come out even before we exit or whatever. It's like optics be damned. We're going to try and do what's you know dispassionate and rational for the for the investment portfolio. Yeah. That's where all the gray hair came. <laughs> yeah, that was tough. It was really tough. We had um, one of our university endowment investors was a pretty significant portion of our assets in 08, 09. And um, this is a little bit more industry, like in-depth knowledge and you guys probably are, you know, care about. But in 08, 09, the university endowments, which were our core client base, were suffering a very unique problem and that was, um, the public markets were declining, which was providing them more opportunity, and any rational investor would start allocating more money as the market's dropping. But they had what's called the, de the denominator effect, where essentially the private book was overcommitted and was also seeing opportunities, and therefore they needed to fund their private equity port capital calls. And so there were situations where major universities were borderline insolvent because they had these unfunded liabilities to private equity that they had made. And the only place that they could fund those was pulling from the public markets, so it added fuel to the fire. So in March of 2009, as things were just you know, troughing, I got a call from our largest investor, their public equities team, and he said, Brian, we're consolidating around a handful of public uh, equity managers, which means we're firing some people. Um, you're safe. And I was just like, Phew. you know, I was just like, <laughs> I went home and you know, sat with the Fosters, you know, it was like, um, so it, it was a big moment because like I had employees that I, you know, were paying and mortgages, people that were required and stuff. So it's a very, very difficult time period. That being said, you know, my peers were getting washed out. You know, there's friends of mine in Austin that ran hedge funds that got all their money from, you know, Lehman Brothers or whatever. So we had a great group of long-term, non-taxable, perpetual time horizon money so one of our structural advantages is actually our client base. I mean, they're long-term. There are not a lot of intermediaries between us and the end decision makers. And so these large cascading movements of money in and out of our firm aren't as big of a deal for us as they are for others, which is a huge structural advantage that showed itself in 08, 09. Although that was the 100-year flood for our client base. So it's very difficult. Um, also, a tangential question I get a lot is, well, if stuff was cheap in your portfolio, in March of 09, it was screaming cheap, so why not go from 10 stocks to 20 stocks in microcap at that point? And the answer is, is like, we don't want to just over diversify for the sake of accepting more money. And we made promises to our investors, we're going to keep those promises. So we stayed at 10 stocks, and people then say, well, okay, well, it was really cheap in March of 09, why not take more money and just jam it in those 10 stocks? It's like, well, when you own 17% of the shares outstanding of this little microcap stock, you can't put any more money into it. And so we were just sort of locked up. Um, and, you know, it might have frankly saved us a little bit too because, you know, a allocator, university endowment office is probably looking at us going, microcap? Like, how's he going to unwind all those positions? Like, we can't pull money from him, you know? Let's pull money from the large cap guy. So we probably got a little bit lucky in that time period too, but, you know, this business has always been, you know, two parts really hard work and one part luck. So, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, well, you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> we had somebody here that worked for us. Um, we have a collegial office that we have one compliance meeting a month. Other than that, there's just no BS. It's here's a company credit card, get on the road, do your job. There's no, nobody tracking timesheets. It's a very casual office. 
Um, you know, people come in in jeans and Birkenstocks or whatever, whatever you want to wear. It's Austin, so it's kind of, you know, feels comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would say that everybody at the firm, like, I would trust them to watch my kids over the weekend. Like, they're just nice people. On top of that, I would want to just go grab a beer with anybody in the firm, too. They're just fun people. They all have, everybody has each other's backs. Very collegial. And we get that from a rotating stable of interns. We get that feedback. It's like, you guys have a unique culture in that, you know, uh, everybody's on the same page. They know what they do. Uh, but everybody's treated like an adult. So there's not, you know, like, at the end of the year, there's not, you know, 16 categories that I'm rating people on or whatever, you know. It's like there's intellectual honesty is pretty, pretty uh, prevalent in the, in the firm. And people aren't incented on weird things that make, that induce weird behavior. Uh, comp is pretty subjective. I mean, there's a base comp that's not subjective, but the, the bonuses are reasonably subjective, except at the top where it's tied to performance of the actual portfolio, which is very objective. And so, you know, beyond that, people are just incented to do their job in part because they're, you know, trying to pitch in for the team. They want things to work out. And the beauty of what we're doing is that if you source an idea, from the lowliest intern all the way to the top, and it's a good idea, it's gonna impact the portfolio and it's gonna impact the, the performance of these big university endowments in a big way. I mean, you know, a 30% position by weight in the portfolio, you know, it's, you know, once you are a research analyst at our firm and we end up with a 30% weight in your idea, you'll learn what pressure is like, you know? But it's fun, I mean, that's why we're doing it, you know? I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be at Fidelity or something and to do a bunch of work on a name and have it be 0.03% of a portfolio. It's just meaningless in the context, right? Of not only just that portfolio, but then the ultimate investor's portfolio where that fund is only a 1% position. I mean, it's just, you know, to me it's just bonkers. So we just like the way we do it. Um, the other thing is our hiring process is a little bit unique in that we don't, um, so we have, a, we have a junior analyst track where it's three years and then you're out. Um, and that's because we are structured with a cap on assets. And so we can't give this sort of upward path for everybody in the firm. So we have this pool of rotating junior analysts that come in, they work hard for three years, then they go to business school or they go to another firm or they start their own firm or whatever they want to do. Um, but you come in, you work really hard for three years and you get to see all these companies and travel all over the country and you know, apply your craft. Uh, we get great work out of out of the analysts. They love working for us, but there's you know, sort of a an adult conversation at three years. It's like if there's a tenure track spot, we'll pull from the you know, the junior analyst pool. But generally speaking, the people on the upper tier of the organization aren't going anywhere, so they're they're they move on. So it it helps us keep fresh eyes on ideas too. So new you know youthful enthusiasm is helpful for a firm like ours every now and then. So. Um, See, I'm trying to think of any other cultural, uh, we, don't, we don't have like corporate values or anything like that. I don't really believe in mission statements and things like that, so. Well, how about this? I'll, here's, here's how I make sure intellectual honesty happens in our organization. So if we have a presentation on an idea, let's say IBM is an idea and it, goes through the process and it's presented formally to the research team. I start with the youngest person in the room, the least tenured person at our firm, and I get their feedback. And then it works its way up to me. Because I know that the youngest person will not be intellectually honest with me once they know my opinion, right? Because everyone wants to please the boss and the bureaucratic uh, pressures are to not give your unvarnished opinion when you're young and have a unique or contrarian take on something. I mean, it's a very you know, diluting environment. And so we start with the least tenured person because I want people's sort of unvarnished and contrary opinions on things. And so that's one way that we try and keep things honest. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we look for things that are very similar to what a lot of other managers in the value crowd look for uh, in terms of like uh, high insider ownership, you know, aligned incentives in the proxy. We want to make sure that, you know, a founder owner operator sort of dynamic exists. And so we, we like it when there's a huge, you know, uh, outside passive minority interest sort of alignment with 
a founder stake in a company. So that, that's you know, an obvious one that a lot of people will look for that we also look for. Um, we, we also look for something we call encore performances. So if somebody's been successful in building a business somewhere, um, typically they're pretty good when they do it again. And so um, you'll see in all of our portfolios this sort of common theme where you know, the CEO or top team has been successful somewhere else and they're doing it again, you know, this time in small cap or whatever, you know. And so we'll look for what we, we sort of call it encore performance internally. And so um, that's, a, that's one sort of pattern thing that's popped up over the years that, um, that we glom onto. Um, we also go beyond this sort of great capital allocator mon or like a label that, that everyone in the value crowd seems to have. You know, it's like uh, everyone's looking for this Henry Singleton or Warren Buffett analog where they're you know, sitting isolated in an office and pulling the strings on capital allocation. That's okay, but we actually look for great strategic operators as well. And so, you know, walking a factory floor with a manager uh, and having them talk about competitive products and, you know, why they're driving to, you know, continue to lean on their competitive advantage and this is what we're doing differently and, you know, we're going to go into this market, you know, tangentially next and blah, 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 blah. You know, that's really important too. So I think management is just bigger than just buybacks versus dividends or being good at m and it's, it's this whole suite of things. And increasingly, I like this sort of talent stack analogy where it's like, you know, it's not a checklist, but people have got to have a lot of, you know, personal characteristics that allow them to be successful. They have to be visionary. They have to be persuasive. They have to be smart. They have to be dispassionate. They have to have all these sorts of characteristics. So, you know, it becomes obvious when you do it over and over again who really, who's really exceptional. Um, and so that's just part of getting your reps in, I think, for us. It's like, you know, the first company visit you, you go on as an analyst with us, you'll think, oh, you know, that's a really interesting company. And then you do 10 of them, and you look back in the first meeting, and you're like, eh, it's probably average. And then you do 100 of them, and you look back in the first one, and you're like, I can tell you now that that was you know, good, bad, average, or whatever, just based on this library of information and, and building up the reps and the pattern recognition starting to kind of harden in your brain. Yeah? Can you talk about your sell process? I imagine if, if you're saying you own 17% of some of this smaller cash, how do you go about selling it and you auction it? So no, we, we've never shorted a stock and we don't own and, and have never owned any derivatives. We are plain and simple common stock pickers, uh, just long only common stock pickers. Um, so there's two parts to that. You know, one is the investment reason for selling, and then two is the actual mechanics of selling. The investment reasons for selling is we'll sell something if it's sort of wildly overvalued, if the thesis is sort of handicapped in some way, um, you know, we've made, made a mistake, or if there's just a better relative value trade out there. Let's say something's 150 cents in the dollar, and it's a good business, but there's a better business available at 80 cents in the dollar, we'll sell this one and buy this one, you know. Um, so that's a pretty standard sort of sell discipline slide that probably most managers have. So I don't think we're materially different from other managers with one exception. That is, we'll tend to hang on to stocks after they've reached our estimate of intrinsic value for all those reasons I talked about earlier, price being like our least reliable indicator of, you know, whether to invest and how much. And so if something exceeds our intrinsic value estimate, we'll typically hang on if we really like the name. Um, the actual mechanics of selling, um, mid-large cap is pretty straightforward. I mean, there's a lot of daily liquidity in most of those names. If we take a few weeks to get into or out of a name, that's not a big deal for us. Um, the, the problems are you buy a microcap stock, you're wrong, the stock goes from seven to one, and you own 15% of the company. And in those instances, we've taken nine months to get out of the positions. You know, they call them roach motels. You can get in, but you can't get out. You know. Um, and we've, we've suffered our share of black eyes in that area, but um, you know what? It's the price of being in microcap and the rewards are much greater, so it's worth you know, going through those hiccups every now and then. Yeah? So what do you think like, the benefits of living and working out of Austin are? Is that kind of a non-factor that y'all are always traveling? Um, so there's good and bad. The, the bad is you know, everyone goes to New York, and so if you want to be in the sort of deal flow of management teams coming and doing you know, in-office visits with you. I mean, it's much easier to be in New York. Travel is much easier to be in a ma major hub like Houston or Dallas would be much better. Um, so there's a couple of knocks against it. Uh, the goods are overwhelming. 
um, I think. You know, the quality of life in Austin. I love Austin. I fell in love with the city when I moved there in 96. You know, love the food, music, all that sort of stuff, lakes. And so we, um, so we have a huge applicant pool for any opening, which is awesome. And, you know, it's just, I think most people just want to live in a popular millennial city like Austin. And so people, you know, people throw us resumes all the time, especially those that are fl fleeing like the higher tax jurisdictions like California, New York. Um, you know, it helps us not being in the midtown Manhattan sort of rat race too. You know, I'm not comparing our firm AUM numbers or profitability with anybody else. I don't care about that stuff. Um, we, we can think and kind of do our own thing. Like I didn't have a New York stint in my background and so like I built the business sort of from first principles like that made sense to me. And so I didn't inherit that like Midtown Manhattan hedge fund DNA from anybody else too. And so we're just kind of this quirky island in Austin and we've gotten used to that over 18 years. We kind of like it and now it's probably a badge of honor. So. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a pain to have to connect through Dallas and Houston when you travel. Um, I was telling Dave earlier, we have 18 years and we, um, last year we got our, or two years ago maybe, is it last year maybe? Two years ago we got our first Texas client. Wow. Yeah. So almost three billion in assets and it took 16 and a half years to get a Texas client. So, um, so we've, yeah, we have to travel to see people, <coughs> they have to travel to see us. Yeah, good question. I mean, part of it when I look back is I was uh, probably like a therapy couch question or something, but um, uh, probably it was like an early insecurity about money. So when I was growing up, my dad was in medical school. We didn't have any money. And it wasn't like, oh my God, we were poor. Or anything. You know, it was like, I think, I just remember my dad being very influential in my life and like taking us from bank to bank to like get a better interest rate and like and all that stuff. And so I think I just, became intellectually curious about it. And I always thought, you know, for me, this business has never been about, um, it's never been about applause. A lot of my peers in this business, it's about applause. Like I wanna be like the next Warren Buffett. I wanna be like the guy in the, you know, Forbes magazine and on CNBC and stuff like that. That has zero appeal to me. The money's nice, but for me, it was about independence. I just didn't want somebody coming up at any point in my career, putting a gun to my head and saying, you have to do something that's uncomfortable because your paycheck depends on it. And so for me, that was like an entrepreneurial motivation that was incredibly strong in my life. And if I'm honest with myself, I don't really know where it came from. It's probably just uh, you know, a combination of environmental factors and maybe a little hereditary stuff because it seems to run in my family. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a real good answer for that, but uh, you know, I was the weird kid, you know, in college at the bar that was counting the patrons and trying to calculate how much the bar, the bar was making rather than just enjoying the beer. So, um, you know, I don't know, it's partly wiring and partly just, you know, intense interest. So, I'll get to you in a minute. That's a great question. Um, so here, interesting little tidbit is it's probably a half a million to a million bucks a year to be public, okay? And that's if you're trying to be thrifty about it. I mean, it's just really expensive to be public. And so when you think about it, you know, uh, 10 times earnings on uh, 10 million and, and earnings gets you a $100 million market cap. That's like kind of in the middle of the mar micro cap space. I mean, a million bucks a year, and and public company costs is 10% of your profits. It's just like, why do it? And the answer is, is most people are not anymore. And so when I started the business, there was like 7,800 companies in the Wilshire 5,000, which is the broadest measure of market capitalization from top to bottom. Despite being called the Wilshire 5,000, there were 7,800 companies. Today, there's less than 5,000 companies. I think there's like 45 or 4,600 companies now. And all of that shrinkage is coming from the smallest market caps, you know, Dodd-Frank, Sarbanes, all that sort of stuff has come in and it's just making regulatory complexity so great that people are just, you know, it's not worth it to be an $80 million public company anymore unless you have a really good plan for growth and you really needed the capital and there was probably some quirk in your history that made you go public. Um, 
and then remember that you know microcap is a graveyard for public companies as well. So it could be that they're going out and they're on their way to disappearing. So you know that's a huge drag on the space as well. So um, so yeah, every company's got a different reason for being there. You know most it's pretty straightforward. Hey, we were public because. You know, a bunch of employees own shares. They wanted public markets. We maybe needed to raise a little capital. You know, some combination of those things. And um, yeah, if a company's permanently destined to be a sixty million dollar microcap company, they're probably not worth being public. And there's probably, you know, a hundred firms out there that are private equity firms that are licking their chops to take it public and remove that million dollar line item and put that in their own pocket. Yeah. Keep going. No, no. So you were talking about, uh, you were talking about companies that are approaching founders and thinking yeah. you can't get out. Uh, can you tell us about the one of those? Like, did, you said that you had these black guys. Can you tell me, like, <laughs> you want war stories? OK. Um, <laughs> well, that you are is just Bed Bath & Beyond. Bed Bath & Beyond? <laughs> Bed Bath & Blower sounds up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever went on the site. We we owned bids.com. I don't know, B-I-D-Z, I don't know if you remember that. It was like it was like this sort of third rate like pawn shop jewelry that was sold like in a kind of eBay sort of format. And so we bought it at seven and it went to one. And um, didn't work out like we wanted. And you know, it's a too long of a story to give you the full, you know, top to bottom on it. But um, yeah, it took it took like nine months to get out of the name. And we actually owned a company um, Kind of on the flip side, it wasn't a success, but it was a similar Roach Motel, but um, it just didn't do anything. We bought a company called Hawkins Chemical, which is like a, a regional chemical distribution company that was in the upper Midwest. We owned it for a couple years, and it just kind of went sideways, and the thesis didn't really play out like we wanted to. Great little company, but um, but we owned all this. I mean, we owned hundreds of thousands of shares, and it traded like 2,000 shares a day. And I was just like, we're never going to get out of this thing. You know, it's going to be months and months of just... 100 shares, 200 shares, 100 shares. And out of nowhere, we found a other side of the trade and we were out of it in like two weeks. And so sometimes that happens. It's just kind of weird. Like you never know when, you know, Fidelity or Vanguard is rebalancing or, you know, wants to be on the other side of, of your transaction. And we're happy to obviously accommodate in those, those instances. Yeah. Just sort of since you've learned, since you've written a lot about like asking every tool that it works and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we we prefer the fanaticism for our particular style of investing. I think first and foremost is we want people that are on board with us. The people that have worked out the best for us are like, I want to work for you because I've independently come to the conclusions that you've come to. Does that make sense? Like, I'm, you know, I was into Buffett, whatever, but I'm just like huge on moats and competitive advantage and, and all this sort of stuff. And they have like the theoretical basis for why they've gotten to that point. You know, whether you got a 3.8 or a, you know, 3.2 GPA or whether, you know, we have people from Princeton, we have two guys from Princeton in our office and we have people from Nebraska or, you know, some random college in the Midwest or whatever, you know, like we have, it doesn't matter where you went to school, um, you need to be smart and passionate and hungry, all that stuff, but it's really, really important that you understand like the theoretical basis for why we're doing what we're doing. And then um, you get turned turned loose pretty quickly, and you can be pr pretty productive, you know, in pretty short order. Yeah. So let's say you actually hit a grand slam in your small cap strategy, and now something is ten point thirty billion market cap. So it's not necessarily small cap anymore. Yep. Is that reason enough to sell it out of that? Yeah, market? great question. So obviously, high class problem. <laughs> um, and yes, it's happened multiple times, which I'm very happy to say. Uh, yeah, and so um, we don't have an upper bound per se that where there's a, a statutory exit from the portfolio, like the contract says sell. Uh, we have sort of a, an agreement among our investors in microcap that if something gets to about a billion and a half, we'll have some sort of orderly exit from the name. Um, but, you know, we'll have conversations around that if there's extraordinary circumstances. We feel like we've got really competitive research. If there's you know, another 30% or 50% we see for some reason, there's some catalyst or something, we may just go to everybody and say, here's what we own. It's 20% of the portfolio, and it's a billion and a half. We want to own it for another six months. And when you compound at 17% you know, for 18 years, like you tend to have 
the clout at that point to go to your investors and say, hey, we can, you know, we'd like to do this, and they'll be like, yeah, no problem. Um, you know, not so in a you know brand new strategy with you know a shorter track record and no confidence of your investors, but in general, we get to we get to have those conversations and kind of do what we, we what we'd like to do. Um, in small cap, that number is 10 billion. So in small cap, we're bounded by the the market caps of the Russell 2000, which is I think about three and a half billion on the upper end as of the latest reconstitution. Um, so we'll hold past three and a half billion. Let's say we buy a billion dollar company in small cap, and it graduates past you know three and a half, four, five, six billion dollars. If it gets to 10 billion, it's like it's not a small cap anymore. Let's let's move on. Um, typically, we're exiting before that. We'll wait for some disparity between price and intrinsic value, and we'll sort of take that opportunity to trim it out and move on. We'll still follow it because it may be on limits for mid-large. Um, mid slash large is named as such because we actually don't like that upper bound issue. And so rather than having a mid-cap strategy and then a large-cap strategy, we just said, all right, we're just going to have a, essentially a mid-cap strategy with a, no upper bound. So in mid-large, we have 10 sort of mid-cap-ish uh, names with essentially no upper bounds. So hopefully we find the next you know, Google or Facebook or whatever, and, and we can ride it to tens of billions or $100 billion or whatever. So, Yes? That's a good question. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's a, as much a qualitative as a quantitative exercise. And so it's about understanding, um, you know, sort of the TAM, the tangential opportunities from their core products, and increasingly what the appetite is for the management teams to engage in mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, you look at some companies and it's like, we explicitly want to grow through acquisition. Well, you say, you know, I've read the research, 80% of acquisitions fail to meet their intended synergy targets. Like, that's not a good batting average. And so, let's just avoid acquisitions. Well, you would have missed Berkshire Hathaway, right? Like, probably, you know, archetype one of the best M&A story of all time. So, you know, in my career, I was sort of avoidant of acquisitions generally and kind of came around to it after sort of thinking this through that if you can identify the 20% that do it really well, that can be a huge point of qualitative differentiation and can lead to some of the best long-term compounding stories. There's a, there's a great book out there called 100 Baggers, and it's like the contents of the book aren't, you know, I mean, it's like there's no huge insights in the book in my opinion, but it's just a sort of a chronicling of all the companies that have 100 times themselves. And if you look at it, there's a bunch of, in that list, there's a, a bunch of M&A driven stories like Danaher and Berkshire Hathaway and others. And so, you know, it'd be stupid for us to just sort of totally remove that category as I ignorantly did in the first couple years of Bears Capital. Uh, increasingly sort of came around to this. Let's, let's focus on M&A as a category and see if we can understand the people well enough to, to know whether there is a abnormally skewed distribution of outcomes that's in our favor based upon just the people. And um, I'd say we have a, don't have a 100% track record in that, assessing that, but we're doing pretty good. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you, you would want to run like an M&A. So could you share like what you did when you called it the M&A, like you did with it, and you kind of led us in that story? Hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of formative stuff, um, you know, I, I think I was informed by, uh, you know, growing up with sort of garage sale Christmases and stuff like that, you know, and I, I was pretty, as a result, pretty thrifty in my, uh, my sort of early entrepreneur days. Like, uh, I didn't have cable TV, you know, like I said, I, you know, had almost uh, no expenses in the world, including no f food in the fridge or anything like that. It was just sort of single minded. About, uh, about making it happen. The frugalness is something that I used to kind of wear as a badge of honor, but may have gotten me into some trouble too. Um, so th this is a rare story about my firm is the first nine years of Bears Capital, I didn't have a lawyer. So I just like did all the contracts myself and everything like that. I don't recommend that. It's a horrible, <laughs> horrible path to take, but I was just so cost conscious that I was like, I don't know if this thing is gonna work. 
And so I need to bring the break-even cost just like, you know, so low, like there, or, you know, I need to bring expenses so low that, like, you know, I just need sustainability because I have no plan B. You know, I just threw everything into this and I was prepared to burn through my savings. And, and, and so um, anywhere I could shave a few pennies, I would do it, you know. And so I think that's, that was a helpful attitude in getting to break even in sustainability. But it was a little bit reckless in a couple areas too that I was, you know, got frankly a little bit lucky and, you know, finally now have good attorneys and good contracts and things like that. But um, I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily recommend that. It also may have extended the runway a little bit. And what I mean by that is had I spent a little bit more money in just sort of getting stuff up to speed quicker, I might have seen the hockey stick of assets under management growth uh, a little bit earlier. So I don't know. I mean, it's worked out great. So I'm, you know, hindsight at this point is 2020. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, frugality, drive is super important. Just sort of the grit and fanaticism for the business. Um, it really, really helps to have timing work in your favor too. I mean, like, you know, I started in June of 2000, which sounds like the worst time ever to start an investment management business because it was the dot bomb era. But um, it just so happened that value stocks, you know. We're kind of doing this while all the, you know, the the bubble stocks were kind of declining, and I was on this side. And so, you know, it it we had good performance in excess of market averages. Obviously, that helped early too. Um, you know, there's it's just two parts hard work, one part luck. I have a really good friend in Austin that started a firm in 2007. You know, it's like it was great, 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 and then and he was so far below high water and there was so much um, dislocation of the market that he just folded up shop. Um, and so, you know, there's stories like that where, I mean, good person, great entrepreneurial spirit, spirit, lots of drive, worked hard, and just timing was just poor. And so you have to be a little bit lucky. Um, somebody said, uh, I think it was a Twitter account that I follow, somebody said, oh yeah, it's, this business is easy. You have to work really hard and have your career coincide with a 30 year decline in, the, in like benchmark interest rates or something like that, you know? And it's just like, so much of this is luck. I mean, it could be for the next 30 years we see, you know, depressed economic activity and this is a morose business to be in for another three decades, who knows? Or it could be bumper crop, you know, for 30 years, you just don't know. Um, I don't know, Dave, what would you say to, to that? Do you have any personal characteristic sort of data points that would? I, I think there's a, a, a lot of similarities. Um, when I started my firm, I was just flat scared. And fear is a powerful, powerful motivator. So I left and I kind of ran this math in my head. I worked for a bank in their investment trust department. And I kind of went through my client list and said, okay, I'm going to have uh, no clients, maybe a few will go with me, but then it was 1999, I knew the market was due to correct. I thought the market's gonna take away half the assets and then the other half, the clients are gonna fire me, so I better live my life that operates on only 25% of what I think I'm gonna get. And I had planned this for about three years and uh, saved a bunch of money and then I made sure that I was steady on the phone calling clients saying, how can I help you? Yeah. And I, I told Brian this over lunch, and I, my wife doesn't mind me telling this story, but when I first started my firm, one day my wife sat me down and asked me if I was having an affair. And she's a very strong-willed woman, and it was very out of character for her. And I said, no, but why? And she said, well, you're always gone, and you're always happy all the time now. <laughs> It was a very logical thing, but I, I lived at the office. I was there 18 and 20 hours a day, and I do think the drive, the grit, the passion for the business, you've got to like asking the, answering those questions and getting punched in the face and coming back for more tomorrow. Yeah, and I, so that brings up another point, which is I think a personal, it's not a characteristic, but it's a situation. This was so much easier for me at 27 not being married with kids. I think if I did that now, I have a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 5-year-old, and I just don't think I would have the energy to pour what I did into the business and have enough left over to, you know, you know, to pour into what are the most important things in my life. And so I think that piece of it, um, just not being there yet, 
was super helpful. So I'm very happy that I went through my neuroses in my early, you know, my mid, mid to late 20s. Um, and I'm a much more balanced person now. And one of the reasons I'm, more, I'm able to be more balanced is because I have a really awesome team. You know, I mean, you met most of the, the team. And so, um, you know, it, I was, you know, for years, like kind of everything, you know, it was like, if we had to pick a health plan, it was like, well, we didn't have a health, a human resource department, it was me. If we needed to hire somebody, if we needed to, you know, whatever, it's just everything falls in your lap. And then you have to also get clients and invest and balance statements and send out, and it's just everything falls in your lap. And so it takes, it's an all consuming effort for a long time. And, you know, it might have been a better plan to go out and raise some outside money, give somebody 30% of the business or something for enough money to hire a couple people to do all that stuff and have me just focus on the two value drivers of the firm, which is to, you know, recruit the right clients and to compound the money. I mean, those are the two value added parts of our business is getting the money and compounding the money. And those two pr parts of the profession pay very well as a result. Um, operations, you know, trading, all that stuff is incredibly important as well and can be very value add and you need the right people in those, those uh, parts of the organization. But without the clients and without the compounding, you know, those other functions are, you know, are moot because you don't have a firm. Well, we never sell our numbers, um, which is a good thing. The numbers are, are good, um, but we don't sell the numbers. We sell people, philosophy, process. And we do that because the numbers aren't always going to be there, especially in a concentrated portfolio. We have these disconnects where we're down, the market's up. And so if people are focused on the numbers as sort of the lead hook, that's what they're going to focus on all the time. And that's what the conversations are going to be about every month or quarter that you know, the numbers aren't working out for them. And so our best um, results with long-term relationships and clients have been those that have bought into the people philosophy and process. And I sort of liken it, I'm a college football fan because I'm from Nebraska, but um, you know, I sort of liken it to just pay attention to the blocking and the tackling and the formations and you know, the reps at practice and you know, the score should take care of itself. And so if rather than just assessing the football program that just puts up the most touchdowns, it's like, let's, let's actually tear the program apart and see who's the most disciplined about practice, who does the best recruiting, who does the, you know, I think analysis of an investment manager should be similar. In the same way that we actually look at companies. It's not just rank ordering on return on capital or whatever the you know, primary determinant of compounding is. It's who is running this business? What's its competitive advantage? What's the structure? It's tearing it apart piece by piece and investing in the people and the philosophy, strategy, process, et cetera. So um, direct answer to your question is I'm sure there are some clients, especially the early ones, that are like, hey, I invested with Brian. You know, he's got my money and whatever. But what they perhaps fail to realize is there's a big team and it's the process that's producing the results. And um, you know, there are guys at my firm and women at my firm that are much much smarter than me and that are executing this process all day long. You know, I've helped to create the ecosystem for this to survive, thrive, and evolve. But you know, in general, like the hard work is being done at various levels of the organization within a process that's producing the results. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. That tweet you referenced a few minutes ago, was that from Morgan Housel? Uh, maybe. I follow like a bunch of those FinTwit guys on Twitter. It's yeah. more for comedy than that's for, familiar. yeah, yeah. It's more for comedy than for uh, yeah. information, but yeah, that's, you know. Get us hopefully. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you have any podcasts that you recommend? You referenced that earlier. I, I like uh, the Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast, The Investor's Fuel Guide. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan. Um, anything that he's done so far is stuff that I, I listen to. Um, I, I listen to, I try, I try not to get so deep into the sort of value investing cult where it becomes an echo chamber. So I try to get out of that a little bit. And I like the, you know, Sam Harris, Naval Ravikant, like some of these people that are, that are kind of either Silicon Valley based or they're just kind of outside of investing generally, but just talk about life philosophy and, th you know, you know uh, paths to success and, and other areas of life that I can hopefully 
pull a few pieces from and either improve my non-professional life or sort of glom it onto um, to my professional life. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Please don't apologize. If good questions. All good questions. Yeah, so question we get a lot. Um, some investors are what they call SRI conscious, where you know they'll have no tobacco, no firearms, something like that embedded in their contract. Because we're such a concentrated portfolio, we can customize accordingly. That's not a problem for us to accommodate those sorts of requests, unless they're really onerous. Um, the other thing we're cognizant of is most of our our early clients were university endowments and charitable foundations, and so we're not going to run out and buy Smith and Wesson and you know companies like that. And so those sort of sin stock areas are just generally not places that we go sort of shopping around. So we're just sort of cognizant of that and who our clients are and trying to match. Um, we aren't advocates in any one regard. I sat on a, a investment committee for the Missionary Society of St. Columban, which is a Catholic charity in my hometown, and. Uh, the SRI question, as they were rewriting their policy, was very complicated. And it's just not obvious to me, after going through this, how to address this. Like, I've thought a lot about this and very deeply about this. And is the right answer to not own the companies that you disagree with? Or is the right answer to own the companies you disagree with and try and affect change? And then what's the best way to do that? So there are some people that just say, well, we're having an SRI fund and we're not going to own, you know, the tobacco manufacturers, or we're not going to own retailers that have child labor in Pakistan or whatever. Or, you know, is the right answer some of the advocacy programs where they take a position in a retailer and they advocate and lobby to, for improvements in their supply chain or working conditions or whatever? And I just don't know the answer to that. I just don't know what the best way that capitalist tools can be used to affect social change. Um, especially within a firm like ours that's tasked so narrowly to do a specific thing for an already eleemosynary or charitable endowment. So most of our money, you know, one of our clients, you know, supported Sesame Street, which I grew up on. You know, it's like women's rights in Africa. They do all these great things. Should I be concerned in the investment function with trying to improve, you know, uh, child labor in third world countries, or should I try and compound the capital as much as possible so that they can do that with more resources? in the social programs that they're doing. You know, not obvious to me, and I don't think there's a lot of clear answers. Um, you know, the kumbaya answer is for everybody to work and row in the same direction and try and stamp out all these problems, which I'm a total advocate for. But I don't know if any actions I would take would be, you know, working towards that or against it in, in any sort of obvious way. It's probably a more in-depth question than you wanted to know. But, but I think it's, it's a very difficult question, and. Um, we're, we're not just washing our hands of this and absolving, why, why can we say, well, it's somebody else's problem? Uh, we think about it, we don't invest in companies that we deem are too controversial, and so that's, you know, we don't have a hard and fast screen, but we'll present something and we'll say, huh, is this, a, um, is this something that would be, an, you know, an alarming thing for our clients to see in their portfolio? And if the answer is even close to yes, we'll, we just won't own it. Um, we've had instances, we actually, there was a microcap company we used to own that, um, made female contraception, okay, it's like um, not overly controversial, purchased by the, you know, AIDS organizations around the world, the WHO, distributed, you know, on behalf of women's reproductive rights in Africa, um, could be controversial to, you know, Catholic-focused charities and hospitals and things like that, you know, and so we had to have conversations with our clients, this is something we're contemplating, is this palatable to you? And some were like, yes, this is you know, like perfectly in line with our mission. And others were like, yeah, you know, this is, you know, maybe not so palatable. And so everybody's got a little different take on how to change the world. And so we're just trying to live in the, uh, the cozy middle. Before we finish up with one last question. Mm -hmm. So you obviously have a, a group of college students, mostly traditional age. If you could go back and give your 20-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, man. Don't take myself so seriously. I don't know. I mean, college is a fun age. I mean, it's a 
fun time. It's the one of the few times in your life where, you know, although you probably don't feel it right now, you truly are free once you, um, once you, once you get in the groove of a career and family and stuff like that. You know, free time and a lot of those those things that it seems like you don't have a lot of because you're you know obsessed with schoolwork and getting ahead and getting the first job. You know, it seems like you don't have a lot of free time now, but compared to where you are when you're in your 40s, it's it's night and day. So. Uh, don't forget to stop and enjoy your life a little bit, I would say. Um, uh, in terms of preparing y yourself for the real world and getting out, and I'd say don't try and be something that you're not. Um, don't look at Warren Buffett's life and say he's a, you know, one of the richest guys on the planet and I, you know, what he says really resonates with me. Um, but then say, well, you know, I'm going to go try and do that without understanding what it cost him to get to where he is. Uh, and ask yourself whether you're going to, you know, prepare to pay that price. As a, I think T. Boone Pickens is credited with this quote, oddly. Um, uh, life is real easy. Just figure out what price you'd have to pay to get what you want, and then go out and pay that price. You know, I mean, it's pretty simple actually. And I paid a pretty high price just personally, like in in the early years to get Bear's Capital off the ground. And just be realistic with yourself and ask yourself what price you want to pay. I mean, do you want to have work-life balance? Do you want to have all these things that seem like a luxury that are very Necessary for you to you know take stock and enjoy you know the journey, um, you know if if you do entrepreneurship is probably not the right path for you because it's an all-consuming thing, and it's not you know it's not a smooth line up into the right. It's really squiggly and circuitous to get to where you want to go, and that's even the hard work is no guarantee of success, and so you have to ask yourself if you've got that sort of grit to get there, and if you don't, that's fine too. Um, just find something that fits your personality and make sure you. Um, it, it's in concert with your core values. It's the best I can do. Thank you. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.